um, I'm going to just launch straight into it. I'm going to start by um, reading what is potentially the most well-known passage in the whole Bible. Uh, it is potentially the most well-known, well-known passage outside uh, a church setting as well. This is a really cool chapter. Portions of this chapter have been quoted in movies by poets. Um, they're often read out in marriage ceremonies, uh, used in books and essays, and I'm talking here about 1 Corinthians 13. So you want to turn to that in your Bibles or on your phone or however you're doing that there. I'm going to start from um, the ending of chapter 12. And just the context there, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and he's addressing issues around unity and spiritual gifts and this kind of thing. So ending at verse 27 um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and then moving into the 13th chapter. So verse 27 says this, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? Do all work the miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? No. Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But continue, though, to seek these greater gifts. And then he says this, but now I'm going to show you an even greater way. And we launch into chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels and I don't have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I don't have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, Give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. It does not boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they're going to cease. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For now we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away the childish things. From now, we see only a reflection, like in a mirror but then one day face to face. Now I know in part, but then one day I will know fully, even as I am fully known. Now faith, hope, and love abide in these three, but the greatest of these is love. That word love though is a loaded word in this day and age. Irish playwright and critic George Bernard Shaw has summed up one of the many modern problems that we have with love when he wrote these words. He said, when two people are under the influence of the most violent, most insane, most elusive and most transient of passions, they are required in the presence of a preacher and a congregation to swear that they will remain in that excited, abnormal and exhausting condition continuously until death do them part. And one middle-aged woman described such an adventure like this. She said, we're led to believe that love is passionate, eye-locking gazes, throbbing temples, and rippling muscles. My husband and I can only experience eye-locking gazes if we both happen to be wearing our glasses at the same time. (laughs) And to us, throbbing temples warn of possible high blood pressure. (laughs) And our muscles tend to be more jiggling than rippling. (laughs) The thing is that that word love It is indeed a loaded word these days and with many definitions. Collins Dictionary lists 18 meanings for that one word alone. Bartlett Quotation, the oldest and most extensive collection of quotes, has 1,300 different interpretations for the meaning of love by poets, philosophers and authors. And according to a recent survey by Christianity Today magazine, love is the second most preached topic in churches today surpassed only by the topic of faith and trust in God. But it really is the Bible's definition of love 
that we need to care about because it's the only definition that will hold to eternity. And scripture has much to say on the definition of love. And at the time of the writing of the Bible, there were basically four different words that were used to define how we now condense into one word, love. In Greek, original text, four main words that describe love, each with very distinct meanings. You first of all have storge, which describes that familiar love, love within the family setting, parent-child love. It can also refer to the bond that people have with their pets, between pets and owners, that kind of storge love. Don't tell me I can't love my dog. <laughs> then there's the phileo kind of love. It's a love within a friendship, marked by that mutual respect and care, those long-lasting friendships, that phileo love. And then there's eros, which refers to the idea of physical or sensual love. In the Bible, this word is used particularly in the Song of Solomon, if you get my drift. Eros oft, often represents selfish love. It's love that seeks pleasure and withdraws once the pleasure ceases. Um, singer and band member of the group, the Fugees. Do any of you guys remember the Fugees back in the 90s? Some people do, that's cool. So I love Lauren Hill's take on love. She said, you know, love is an incredible thing. And we don't know love like we should. We always talk about, I have unconditional love. Unconditional love is we don't even know what it is because that person stops stimulating us, we stop loving them. You're not interesting to talk to anymore, bye-bye. That's the Eros love. But then she said, but that real love, that love that sometimes is difficult, difficult to have, that's that love, that's the unconditional. And there she starts to talk into what we're describing in the fourth word as agape love. That represents the divine, unconditional love that seeks the best interest of the one loved regardless of their actions. This is the love that's attributed to God and the love that we aspire to. True love reflects God's nature and whatever you understand about God is wrapped up in that term, agape. And the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, the great love chapter, begins with a discussion of the priority and preeminence of love. Love is a character trait, outstrips all other character traits. It is the priority of the Christian life. And you'll remember during prayer and self-denial, I talked about knowing God's heart and touching on certain aspects about what matters to him. And while those ideas will reflect what matters to God, love can be considered as the definition of God. But yeah, I have called this series the knots of love. Pun a word there going on there. And there's a reason for that too. Because I've heard and read and I've seen a lot of messages that talk about what love is. But not so many on what love is not. Especially when it comes to 1 Corinthians 13. And almost a year ago now, thoughts around what love is not was laid on my heart. And with it came the image of knots. Because just as knots can tangle things up, the knots of love, which we find in this chapter, create emotional and relational messes that block real love. Knots symbolize obstacles and behaviors that can act as barriers, preventing love from being free and genuine and without condition. And to truly experience love, we need to somehow untie these knots to reveal that purer, more Christ-like love. And essentially what God has laid on my heart to speak to is how certain attitudes and behaviors from this passage can tie love up in knots, making it less than what it should be or what it could be. And my hope is that we'll all feel challenged perhaps in this area and in our behavior. If nothing else, that this would be the beginning of potentially untying some of the knots so that we can experience the fullness of love as God intended it. That's essentially what's on my heart around the next three weeks. And with that idea of what love is not, going back to the scripture reading, you'll see there, um, if we can have the next slide, you'll see there that there are eight negatives of what love is not in this chapter. Love is not self-seeking, love does not envy, love does not boast, love is not easily angered, it's not proud, it does not dishonor, it does not delight in evil, it doesn't keep record of wrong. And as I said, this was laid on my heart some time ago, 
But to try and cover off all eight of these in three weeks, I'm just not going to be able to do that justice. So I'm going to cover off three, one a week. And the reason that I'm speaking to these three is twofold. First of all, these knots, these traits that I'm going to be discussing over the three weeks, I've actually personally really struggled with in my own life. At various points in my life, who am I kidding? I'm struggling with them now. <laughs> Some have impacted me more than others, and not surprisingly, more so before I became a Christian. The other reason is that I believe that from these particular knots, elements of the other five mentioned in this chapter are kind of like the consequence of these three. It's kind of the resulting, I guess, cause and effect of the three that are being discussed, like a sub sort of heading there. So with that in mind, I'll begin with the very first of the three knots. And we find it nestled unassumingly between all the various observations on love in this chapter. And there it is in verse 5. Love is not self-seeking. Or love is not selfish. Or perhaps more fittingly, love does not seek its own. And lest any of us think that as a congregation we don't need a message on selfless love or that we perhaps have conquered selfishness in our lives. Let me just share with you a compelling definition of selfishness within the Christian lifestyle. It's an extract from a writing entitled The Traits of the Self-Life. I first heard this through an online sermon and it floored me. I found it so convicting and offering a really well thought out expression of how selfishness can manifest itself in the Christian life. So you listen to this, and this is what it says, traits of the self-life. Are you ever conscious of a secret spirit of pride, an exalted feeling in view of your success or position, because of your good training and appearance, because of your natural gifts and abilities, an important independent spirit, stiffness and preciseness? Are you ever conscious of love of human praise, a secret fondness to be noticed, Love of supremacy, drawing attention to self and conversation, a swelling out of yourself when you've had a free time speaking or praying. Are you ever conscious of the stirrings of anger or impatience which worst of all fall you call nervousness or holy indignation? A touchy, sensitive spirit, a disposition that dislikes being contradicted, a desire to throw sharp, heated words at another? Are you ever conscious of self's will a stubborn, unteachable spirit, an arguing, talkative spirit, a harsh, sarcastic expression, an unyielding, headstrong disposition, a driving, commanding spirit, a disposition to criticize and pick flaws when set aside and unnoticed, a peevish, fretful spirit, a disposition that loves to be coaxed and humored. Are you ever conscious of a jealous disposition, a secret spirit of envy shut up in your heart, an unpleasant sensation in view of the, greatest, of the great prosperity and success of another, a disposition to speak of the faults and failings rather than the gifts and virtues of those more talented and appreciated than yourself? Are you ever conscious of a dishonest, deceitful disposition, the evading and covering of the truth, the covering up of your real faults, the leaving of a better impression of yourself than is strictly true? false humility, exaggeration, straining the truth? Are you ever conscious of unbelief, a spirit of disencouragement in times of pressure and opposition, a lack of quietness and confidence in God, a lack of faith and trust in God, a disposition to worry and complain in the midst of pain, poverty, or at the dispensation of divine providence, an overanxious feeling about whether everything will come out all right? Are you ever conscious of formality and deadness, Lack of concern for lost souls, dryness and indifference, lack of power with God? If so, you have some of the traits of the self-life. Now I'm almost tempted here to stop and ask if anyone made, through that, made it through with that without feeling in some way challenged. And if so, can you please stand up? Because we need to talk. <laughs> I need to know your secret. Because <laughs> if you've even listened to some of that... <laughs> Some aspect of what was said will have gripped you. We all have some level of selfishness in our hearts. Let's not deny it. And the Bible tells us that God's love, agape love, does not seek its own. 
Agape love is love that seeks the best interest of the one loved. Selfishness seeks the best interest of one's own self. The two are at opposite extremes. They're divided in the human being. It's not possible to have agape love and be self-seeking. It was selfishness that caused Adam and Eve to reject God's way in favor of their own desires. Self replaced God in their hearts. And they determined to do their own thing. We know how that turned out. <laughs> love, on the other hand, is not interested in its own way. It's preoccupied with the interests of others. And from this not, I can see how other knots within this 13th chapter become a natural cause and effect scenario that results from this self-seeking nature. You think about it. A natural effect that results in a self-seeking individual is that they are more likely to be jealous or envious of what others have because they are driven by their desire to have it for themselves. Love does not envy. Can I get the next slide up? They're more prone to boasting because they want to elevate themselves and draw attention to their own personal achievements. Love does not boast. A self-seeking person may also be prone to be easily angered, a result of unmet personal expectations or desires, reflecting the self-seeking attitude that prioritizes their own feelings over the feeling and well-being of others. Love is not easily angered. You see there the sub there, what I'm doing there. And I mentioned this not first because it can be argued that this point in the chapter, in verse 5, this is the key to everything else that's going to be said in the series. Because the root of all evil in human nature is the desire to have one's own way. The exact opposite of agape love is self-centeredness. If this could be conquered, none of these other negative traits would be an issue, to be honest. And the more I think about it, here at this point in the passage, which again is why it's so good to begin with it, we're actually touching on the hot button of human relationships in our culture today, zeroing in on the major problem. Because the major problem is man-centered, ego-driven individuals who have not learned how to be selfless. Love does not seek its own. Paul, in his final letter to Timothy, describes what the end times of society will be like in 2 Timothy 3, he writes this, But know this, that in the last days perilous times shall come. Men are going to be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. All of these traits stem from the root of self-centeredness. And Paul jumps on that doctrine, and he says love's not like that. Love does not seek its own. Love considers the other person and gets excited about seeing their needs get met. And I suppose I could stop here, actually, and give a marriage seminar. I mean, I wouldn't know what to say. <laughs> I'm not married. <laughs> Shockingly, I don't do much counseling either. <laughs> but if I did, this is what I would pinpoint on. Because this is the root of the problem. This is the root of the problem in parent-child relationships. This is the root of, problems of the problem in most education situations. This is the root of problems within business relationships. As I said, this is the hot button issue of human relationships. Unfortunately, the Bible does offer us some help here because there are numerous examples within scripture of selflessness. Ruth's devotion to Naomi as she gives up her own, own future and the security to remain loyal and care for her mother-in-law, even though it would have been so much easier for her just to return to her family and after her husband's death. There's Moses and his willingness to sacrifice himself for the sake of the Israelites, leading them through the desert, interceding on their behalf after they sinned by worshipping that golden calf. There is a sense of responsibility for others that Moses emulates. The writer of Corinthians, Corinthians 13. Paul wrote those books. Paul, his ministry exemplifies a life of selflessness. 
where he's continuously sacrificing his own safety and well-being to help others know Jesus. But ultimately, if we are wanting the highest example of, self, of selflessness, we have to look at the life of Christ. And I want you just to listen to this. It's from the book of Philippines. You may or may not have read it. But this is talking about Jesus. I'm starting in verse 1. Therefore, if, any, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. There's First Corinthians 13 right there. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the other. In your relationships with one, one another, here it is, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. He took on the very nature of a servant, and he was made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. And so God then exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here, right here, Paul is expressing his conviction about who Jesus is. But this text does so much more because it offers the example of Jesus as a way of life for us to imitate. And this can be done. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't have written this. This is possible for us. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 19 says, Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone that I may win as many as possible. That's what it means to be selfless. I just came, I just, two months ago, I came back from America. I'd been in America for three weeks, three and a half weeks, and it was just basically um, a long overdue break that I needed. Um, before I went to America, I was burning out. <laughs> um, I have talked about my work before, it's pretty full on in there. Um, <laughs> There's a lot happening there, it's organized chaos, and you know, it was really starting to um, get to me. Um, and this stuff was running around in my head, you know, I've been thinking about this for a year. But for some reason, I lost that in my work setting. Um, and I went to America, and that was really good, because it was a really good way for me just to have a reset and a regroup about what am I doing, who am I, What's going on with work? How am I at work? Who am I at work? Because that's where I spend most of my days. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was just really good to have that reset because before I went, um, none of this was really in play in my spirit. I was more focused on getting the job done, getting things finished, you know, rushed, getting it, you know, all that kind of jazz. It's, yeah, there's just a lot going on, there still is. And then when I came back, God kind of just threw all of this in front of me again, which is why I needed the break. I wanted to remind me of, you know, what, what the truth is. And so I went back to work and I said to myself, I've got to shift gears here in my heart and my spirit because I'm not enjoying this. I don't like being there. <laughs> I want to be different. I want to be better at this. I want to enjoy my work. And I realized that this right here, make myself a slave to everyone, was key. It was God saying, this is the solution. And so I've gone back to work in the last two months with the attitude of, yes, I have my job to do. Yes, I've got work to do, but I am proactively putting that second almost, but instead looking more at how I can help others in the workplace. Because I'm stressing out, I've got a lot going on, so is everybody else. I've actually got some people here from work today. 
You know exactly what I'm talking about. It's full on. And so for me, it's about how can I help other people do their job better and then I'll work on my stuff. And I'm certainly not perfect. One of my colleagues here sits right next to me. <laughs> she sees me every day. <laughs> she knows exactly who I am from the inside and the out. And uh, you know I don't always get it perfect. <laughs> and I am sorry for the times that I get it wrong. I am trying. <laughs> But it has been a bit of a reset for me, a mind change for me, and it's, it's been really good. And it's helped me reassess who I am and how God sees me. And putting others first, you'd think you're going to get more stressed out because, oh, I'm not going to get to my stuff. But actually, it's freed me to somehow get my stuff done quicker, which is quite interesting, and yet still be able to support those around me. Though I'm free, I belong to no one, and I belong to no one, I still want to be a servant to everyone around me. And that's what selflessness looks like. And that's a principle that will make the church healthy as well, that principle of selflessness. Each person looking around to see where they can invest themselves, not out of a desire to gain or get a reward, but that the purposes of God can move forward as they themselves gives to the ministry whatever that is, because love does not seek its own. And I'm talking a lot here about loving others, but I was thinking about this this morning, and I just want to add a little sort of side note. Because this also, everything that I've said here, also applies to you, individual, whoever you are, about loving yourself because I think sometimes we can be quite selfish to ourself, if that makes any sense. We're hard on ourselves, we berate ourselves, we put ourselves down, we make ourselves feel rubbish, we feel we aren't worthy, we feel we aren't valued. Often that's just a reflection of how people are potentially treating you. And rather than centering yourself in on how God sees you, you allow other people to influence those feelings and emotions, those negative feelings. And so in a way, you're selfish in taking care of yourself. And you know who you are. If I'm talking to anyone, that's great. Be kind to yourself. Be selfless with yourself, whatever that looks like. I don't know, that was just something that came this morning, so for someone, <laughs> maybe. But as I finish up this, um, I would like to say this, that I do think we have a lot of this selfless love going on in church already, and I'm really grateful for it. I've shown this before of prayer and self-denial too. This is everything we do in church, <laughs> all the different ministries we've got going on, and it's still a lot, isn't it? <laughs> and a lot of these ministries, you know, they don't get much acknowledgement. We're not up here, you know, talking about these ministries every Sunday. But they are all run by people in this church. People who get no credit for what they do, but week in and week out, they are ministering to others. They have love. They do it sacrificially. They do it because the love in their hearts makes them want to turn away from their own needs, wants, and desires and give themselves and their substance back to God. That's where the joy is found. And the thing is, the world is crying out in the midst of the cheap substitution of self-centered love for something that is divine, some embodiment of what it means to love without regard to oneself. And that's something that we as a church, as individuals, can offer as we move through our day-to-day -day life here in Hawke's Bay. Last week, Daniel spoke to this. If you don't know where to start, start by finding someone to serve. He literally said that. I couldn't believe it. I thought, he's just, pre he's just prepping for this Sunday. Just start there. Someone that you can support and encourage and look to serve, however that looks like. Faith, hope, and love. We abide in these three. But the greatest of all is love. That agape love. And love is not self-seeking. So let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, I just want to bring this morning to you and thank you, Father, again for the opportunity to share and to speak your word. 
Um, Father, as the worship team come up and we sing the final three songs of the service, I just pray, Lord, that these words um, will land how you see fit on the individuals that have heard it. I thank you, Father, that you are a God of agape love, that you love us unconditionally, that you love us so much that you entered into humanity and died for us. There's no greater love than that. And I just want to acknowledge your goodness to us, your faithful to our, faithfulness to us. I thank you, Father, that through Jesus Christ, we can find salvation and redemption for the wrongdoings in our lives, for the sin in our life. And I just want to praise you and give you glory again, Lord, that um, we are a church that seeking your will and seeking to serve you and seeking to love the community and the people around us. So just help us to keep doing that with that uh, selfless love that we've talked about this morning. Guide us, lead us this week. Give us opportunities this week and help us just to keep our hearts and our minds focused on you, knowing that we are loved and valued and are worth everything to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.